Okay, I think we can we can get started now. Uh, thanks everyone for joining this new episode of our Datadoc On series. Uh, this is a series where we invite engineers who are working uh, at Datadoc, um, building Datadoc on a daily basis, to talk to us about either a technology or a process of how or how they work on a daily basis. Today's episode is on aging integrations development. So if you use Datadoc, uh, you will know uh, what an integration is, but we are going to introduce it as well. And you may know that you as well can develop new integrations. That what is going to be the focus, how we do it that. Um, the previous sessions for Datadoc on are on that website, datadoc on datadochq.com. So if you go there, you can watch this one as soon as this recording is ready and any of the previous ones, and you can register for any future sessions. So uh, if you're interested on these sessions, please go there and, uh, and register. And um, just a little bit of housekeeping. We want to leave at least 15 minutes at the very end, 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So if you have any questions throughout the session, you don't have to wait until the very end. We want to do this as interactive as possible, so please, you use the Q&A button that you should have on your Zoom client. Leave there the question. And at the end, we are going to go through the list of questions that we get. And we are going to try to um, answer them uh, live uh, here today. So without further ado, let's, let's get started. But before we start, uh, just in case someone is new to Datadoc, uh, Datadoc is a monitoring and analytics platform that helps improve observability to uh, of their infrastructure and applications uh, for any company. My name is Sara Polido. I'm a technical evangelist at Datadog, and I'm one of the co-organizers of uh, Datadog on Sirius. So if you have any feedback about the series of this episode or a previous one, or suggestions of what topics do you want us to cover, uh, please reach out through Twitter or my mail, and, and I'll be happy to read those. Uh, but obviously, the important people today is who we have invited, who are uh, Julia and Christine. Uh, Julia, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Julia. I'm a software engineer and I'm the team lead for agent integrations. We are a distributed team and I work remotely from Spain. Perfect. Christine? Hi, I'm Christine. I'm a software engineer on the agent integrations team. Um, I'm so uh, I'm based in the New York City office. Fantastic. Um, so before we, we start talking about integrations, I think it's important to talk a little bit of the scale that we work on. So Datadoc has more than 12,000 customers. Uh, obviously, we are monitoring platforms, so we have to run an agent to gather information from, from our customers' hosts. That, that adds up to millions of hosts. Uh, that when they arrive to, to data, data those, those make up trillions of, of data points per day. And obviously, because we have that many customers, their tech stacks are very, very different. And that's where integrations come in very helpful to onboard this um, variety of different tech stacks. Uh, but uh, before we dive in on how to build integrations, Christine, can you give us uh, an overview of what is an integration and what it's useful for this onboarding and for our customers? Yeah, so um, Datadog integrations, um, it brings together your metrics and logs from your infrastructure and helps us gain um, insight into the unified system as a whole. So the integrations will give you visibility into the individual pieces of your system, and it allows you to see how these individual components interact and affect the system as a whole. So here we see um, the integrations uh, page on the Datadog app. Um, we can see all the in available integrations in your account, and we can explore the different types that Datadog supports. So one of the benefits of enabling integrations is that you can start getting useful metrics, logs, dashboards, and monitors out of the box with minimum configuration. And you can start onboarding these by enabling them, whether from your agent or from um, the app itself. So Datadog also auto detects technologies running on your hosts and they're displayed with the purple detected button and it helps you identify which hosts are running an integration but you have not yet configured them. 
Um, and we do have a couple ways of configuring integrations in Datadog. And uh, one way is through the agent, as I previously mentioned. And alternatively, we have crawlers or library-based integrations that can be installed in this page. So here we see a breakdown of the different types of integrations Datadog has. Um, on the left side, for other integrations, we see cloud and web integrations. And these are the authentication-based or other or previously mentioned as crawler-based integrations. And they're configured within Datadog uh, application by providing the credentials for obtaining metrics from an API. So examples of this would be like Slack or AWS and Azure. Now, agent integrations, these are installed um, with the Datadog agent. And these are collect and these collect metrics through a Python class. Um, Integrations core and extras are um, two repositories supported by Datadog. Integrations core are um, integrations that Datadog maintains, and integrations extras are community maintained integrations. We also, in agent integrations, uh, supports custom checks. And so users can create custom checks when they want to collect something specific to their environment. With agent integrations, um, these are all available through the Datadog agent. So integrations core are available by default and they're bundled when you install a Datadog agent on your host and integrations extras can be installed uh, individually. So the agent itself is written in Go. It's also open source and is um, available on GitHub. Um, and integrations are written in Python. So the agent is able to run integration code via an embedded C Python interpreter. And this is called whenever it needs to execute Python code. And an example kind of configuration we have for us, um, a, the official, like the supported integration is Apache. Here we can see the configuration parameters, and these are often specific to the in individual integration. So we see that the Apache integration requires an Apache status URL uh, configuration field. And um, this is, uh, and this will also, this will be helpful this is used by the integration itself to collect metrics. And in the second part, uh, we see the logs configuration. And this is where we specify the path of the Apache log and uh, it's tagged by the source and service. Um, and this basic configuration will allow the integration to collect metrics and logs from your Apache service. You can also specify multiple instances um, for um, one agent to monitor multiple Apache services. And from the integration, we can get metrics like uh, network traffic. So for example, these metrics would be called Apache net request per second or net hits. Um, the integration also has a service check, which is called Apache can connect. And this informs you of whether the integration was able to successfully connect to the monitoring endpoint. Um, and logs parsing is how Datadog extracts information from your log lines into facets and attributes that can be easily searched and filtered. Here we see our out of the box um, dashboard, and this is available for um, on any account if you have the Apache integration enabled. And this will give you an overview of um, your Apache services as well as recommended uh, metrics to monitor your Apache's um, environment. Cool, very cool uh, intro introduction. Thanks, Christine. So one, one of the things that, that we've uh, you've discussed is that um, the those integrations, integration score and extra run with the agent and the agent is running on our customers infrastructure. So one of the things that one of the promises that we have at Datadog is that anything, any code that is going to run on customers infrastructure is going to be open source and that includes uh, the agent and this type of integrations that are running inside the agent. Uh, Julia, why, why do you think this is, this is important? Well, I think this is important for, for two main reasons. Uh, the first one is transparency. You could be able to audit uh, and look into what you're gonna install in your, in your systems. Uh, and in fact, it, it often happens that customers or prospect customers um, run some kind of audit uh, into the agent and then they may have questions or concerns or they actually find issues and then we work with them to solve uh, the questions or the issues if there are any. 
um, which in turn benefit the rest of the of the customers and users. Uh, the second one is that, well, uh, by being open source and allowing for contribution, everyone benefits from collaborations. Um, we do we do have um, external people who come and fix bugs or add new features, um, and obviously we those get delivered to everyone else. So it's a huge advantage. And as it's been mentioned, we managed two main repos. The first one is integration score. These are the integrations that we build internally at Datadog, and they come included in the agent. Uh, we have 164 integrations and growing. As writing more integrations is our main thing. Um, and go to the past slide. Uh, as, uh, yeah, so these are shipped with the Datadog agent, but they're also released independently from the Datadog agent. The reason we do this is so you can update integrations individually without having to wait for a full agent release. So if we release a bug fix or a new feature in an existing integration, then you can update that immediately. Then we have integrations express. Um, this is a community maintained repo. Uh, we allow for peers to be merged and whatnot, but uh, our involvement is minimal. Um, these integrations do not come with the agent, but you can still install it uh, using a command that comes with the agent. So we do release these integrations, but they just don't come bundled in. Um, Great. Um, so Christine has talked, uh, so now that we know that those are open source, people can have a look at them. And some there is even a full repo that it's maintained by people in the community rather than by, by Datadog. So Christine has introduced very well uh, why an integration is useful for, for someone who wants to pull in metrics from the tech stack. Um, what about why write in, for example, integration? Okay. Um... Well, while writing an integration, I think there are two aspects to this question. One, the first one is, is like the, taking the question very literally, why writing an integration? Uh, there are metrics that Datadog does not have out of the box, and you want them in your Datadog account. And the only way to do that is to write some custom code that will send those metrics to Datadog. The other aspect to the question is why writing and publishing an integration in Express or in the marketplace, for example, I'll go into it in a second. Um, when you publish an integration uh, that you've written into Express, uh, there are multiple benefits to it. Uh, well, the first one, the, the, the obvious one is that you're sharing it with everyone else. So uh, if, if people share what they do, then the whole community benefits from it. Um, another aspect of it is uh, if you are a product owner and you're writing an in a Datadog integration for your product, this is uh, very common uh, actually, then you're gaining visibility into your product because there will be an in-app file in Datadog itself. Uh, but also you can consider this as an extra feature of your product. Like it comes with a Datadog integration and you can monitor your product through Datadog. Um, if it's not your product, or if it is, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, another benefit of sharing, uh, if that wasn't uh, uh, good enough, is that uh, the metrics submitted by your, by your integration will no longer be custom. Uh, so it comes with a financial incentive there. And, and you can also benefit from the community. Uh, People, other people who are using your integration may submit bug fixes or even new features to your integration. As I've mentioned before, we also have a marketplace. This is uh, pretty recent, uh, but you can apply to a partner program to submit integrations into the marketplace. And in that case, you can uh, build for the integration if you want to, and also gain visibility into the product that you're building the integration for. So I think there are lots of good reasons why you should write an integration. I agree, I agree. Uh, you explained it very, very well. Um, so now we have uh, people from Datadog 
different uh, developers writing integrations. We have people from the community who include um, customers, partners, uh, partners in the marketplace. Uh, so it brings a lot of different developers into building the same thing. So um, how do we try to tie that developer experience to be as smooth as possible for that many different people? Christine, you, you want to go with this one? Yeah, so um, for um, for us internally and as other contributors use, we have a developer tool and we also have, you know, developer um, docs are into integration specific guidelines and documentation that helps support um, contributors. So um, our dev package, our dev tool, uh, we like to call it ddev. Um, it is open source. It's written in Python and it's available in integrations core. It can be installed as a Python binary or built locally um, off of your um, the cloned uh, integrations core repo. Um, the, the goals of uh, DDEV is to provide a cohesive user experience. Um, we provide the developer tool to automate the common integrations as well as um, provide validation to enforce protocols and guidelines that we have. Um, so uh, I guess next slide we can talk about DDEV, yeah. So uh, the developer toolkit is often, as I previously mentioned, referred to as DDEV. Um, there are two major parts to it. It's a test framework and it's also a command line, a command line tool. And the CLI provides an interface which invokes tests, manages our end-to-end -end environments, and as well as general repository maintenance. So that includes dependency management, integration scaffolding, and as well as building our developer docs. As mentioned before, um, scaffolding. So the DDEV create um, allows contributors to easily start developing um, by providing scaffolding for different types of integration. So our classic integration includes Python, a Python class, and you can start developing off of that. Um, but we also provide different types like tile only or logs only. Um, and the scaffolding provides the check class, um, which you can start developing um, for metric collection. Um, integration metadata, we provide documentation for metrics, which describes the metrics collected by the integration, which is visible in the integration tile tab, as well as in the public facing documentation. Um, and this gives us um, where we maintain the metric names, types, descriptions, and units. Uh, service checks data that we support, it describes the service check made by the integration and provides the conditions for the statuses of the check. And integration configuration spec, this is what we use to standardize. Um, we use templates to standardize the configuration options for all our integrations, so they're consistently, linked, consistently named. Um, and the assets that we support, like the dashboards, monitors, um, and save views are also um, hosted um, in in integrations core or integrations extras. The base class um, contains functionality and utilities um, necessary for writing an integration. And so there's metric submission. So for different types like gauges, counts, and histograms, as well as events based off of change and, um, and service checks um, to provide the status of the integration itself. And for more advanced needs, um, more than the generic check, uh, we also provide other base classes. So the open metrics base check provides structure and helper functions to collect metrics, events, and service checks exposed by Prometheus. Um, the PDH base check does something similar, and it's collecting metrics from Windows performance counters or uh, via the PDH API. Um, and these base classes are very easily configured. Um, they can be configured just from um, the config itself, and uh, sometimes you don't even uh, technically need additional um, development because the providers are all common, uh, they share like common standards. And in the base package as well, we have utilities that provide standardization in how we do commonly performed functions. So um, for example, the HTTP wrapper has the same interface as the Python request library. And this ensures consistent behavior across all integrations. It automatically parses and uses configuration options from the integration level, as well as the uh, 
Datadog agent level. So if you, for example, have proxy configuration specified, um, the check using the HTTP wrapper will automatically also check that you have um, check the Datadog agent configuration for that um, for that information. Um, we also provide um, a database utility that provides standard way to define and collect data through arbitrary queries. And the base package also supports handling unstructured data like fine grained product version. And this data is captured within our flares or displayed on the agent status page. Good. Um... These these are these are all very useful. So how, for example, for the for the going on back to these utilities, for example, uh, how they how they grow um, is more designed from the from the bottom up, or it's more organically as soon as you start seeing patterns that people are doing rewriting over and over again. Yeah, so these utilities are definitely developed organically as we identify common pain points or um, common. Um, you know, uh, common things that uh, as we're developing integrations and we're noticing, um, that's when we start building these utilities. Um, it it allow it makes it easier to contribute and develop because we've standardized um, everything, and it also makes our review process a lot easier. Yeah, and and I guess this is also part of the uh, common common PR comments when when you see a PR coming in for a new integration that is not using one of these utilities. So this is probably one of the common things to to be asking people to to use. Yeah. Good. Um, so let's go to testing because I imagine like having hundreds of integrations uh, for different completely different tech stacks and having to upgrade them on a regular basis uh, require thorough testing. Uh, Julia, do you, want, do you want to cover how do we do this and how people can benefit from our testing as well? Yep, yeah. uh, so indeed uh, we have hundreds of integrations. Um, they have very little to do one with another. Uh, so so yeah, automated testing is essential because we cannot just keep the context in our heads for all the different services we integrate with. Um, the testing happens in multiple uh, phases. The first one is linking and circling back to, to the common tools. Uh, you were, it's funny you were mentioning how, oh, it's probably common in PRs that you ask people to use these utilities. We're trying to automate that as well. Uh, so we have, uh, we're building a, validation into into the PR that will detect if you're using, for example, the raw requests library and tell you to use the wrapper instead. Uh, so as we see patterns in PRs, we also build utilities around them. So, well, I was mentioning there are multiple stages to testing. Uh, the first one is validation. This uh, is performed also with DDEV, so you can run it locally if you want to or need to. Uh, if you build fails, you can reproduce it locally. And um, what we validate is code style for consistency. We want all the integrations to look similar and for people working on them to be able to move to one another. Uh, and we also validate lots of metadata files and configuration files that are, that are part of the integration that are not code. And we have to be very strict with this because all, all these files are read by external systems, maybe in our backend, maybe in the agent itself. So we need to be very strict with, with them. So we automate that validation and at the first step on a build. Then after that, uh, we run unit tests and integration tests, but I'll speak first with uh, about the unit tests. So a uh, unit test uh, check the logic of your integration. So some integrations are very, very simple and don't have much logic to it. Uh, they just fetch data and send it to Datadog, but uh, it's more common that they have some logic. They maybe act different depending on the version of the service they're talking to, or depending on the configuration options that you've provided to your integration. And so here is the place where you would check for that. Uh, you mock 
the, the service you're integrating with and you also mock the agent. So what you're checking is that the behavior, internal behavior of the integration itself is the, the one that's expected. Then we have integration tests. Okay. And in this case, we still mock the agent, but you run, you run against a real service. Usually this real service is gonna be um, a Docker container. And then uh, what we're checking is that we can actually talk to it, that the, I don't know, expected responses have the right format, that we are collecting the data we are expecting to on the formats we are expecting to, et cetera. Um, so these environments uh, that we run against are uh, usually the containers that I mentioned, but sometimes the service doesn't allow for a simple deployment. So then we would use more complex environments using Kubernetes or Terraform. And even sometimes that's not even possible. And we will have long running environments, long running labs for, for services that are more complex to set up. Or also we do that for catching uh, no, uh, regressions in performance or in memory, et cetera. So we do have some, some permanent environments that we uh, run against. Finally, we have end-to-end uh, -end tests. And now uh, there is no mocking. You're running your integration inside a real agent in a Docker container against a real service. And the reason we do this is because if you remember earlier in the presentation, we mentioned that the uh, integrations are Python code embedded in a Go agent. And sometimes the interaction there can be a bit strange. So it's important that we run the real thing to make sure everything works as expected. So for all of this, you use DDEV as well. And the dev handles the setup for you. So when you define when you define an end-to-end -end or an integration test, uh, the dev will spin the spin the service, the environment. Uh, if needed, it will create instances in the cloud using Terraform. Um, it will also start the Datadog agent image in the case of end-to-end -end tests, in the case of integration tests that is mocked, and then it will run the test. Um, um, well, uh, we do this for every PR, so um, continuous integration. Um, on our GitHub page, you can see in the readme all the statuses, but also on your PRs, you can see um, and the result of every build that has run for your particular PR. And you, uh, the results are public. We, we use Azure pipelines and you can see the whole output, uh, all the steps that run. Uh, you can see the command that was executed. So you can reproduce it locally if you need to, to make sure it passes before you uh, submit a fix. Um, um, well, the tests that run vary depending on the integration, uh, the environments we've mentioned. For every integration, you can define as many environments as you want for different versions of the service, for different operating systems, for different configurations of the system. So for some integrations, we do have lots of environments. So for Zookeeper, for example, there you see you have five environments but that's multiplied by Python 2 and Python 3. So that's uh, double. And then for some of them, they will run both on Windows and Linux. Uh, so the testing metrics can get um, quite big. Uh, in CI, we run all this in parallel. For individual PRs, only the, the integrations that have been affected by the PR do actually run. You don't run everything. Um, and locally, you can select which integration you want to run the test for. Um, we also collect some statistics about the, the test results so we can see how, how they behave over time and we can identify points of instability. Um, so if things start failing randomly, we will see it here. We do not retry on purpose because we've 
found in the past that it was actually that can actually hide actual issues and we don't want to do that um, so we call it statistics and then if, if there is a hot spot we'll see it here cool um that was that was super interesting um I, I, as an external contributor, because I also contributed to, to a couple of integrations on integration sex trusts, uh, I'm not part of the aging integrations team, so I follow the same community process as anyone else. Um, for me, it was, it was really great to see uh, how easy it was to use the dev, not only to start building the scaffolding for my integration, but also to set up all the testing for my integration. In my case, it was a uh, Kubernetes-based integration, so having that in seamlessly integration with, with Kind, so it was perfect because I was able to create all these clusters completely automatically. So that was that was great to see. Um, good. Uh, so that uh, bring us to uh, a topic that is obviously very close to my heart because I'm part of the community team. Um, as, as we mentioned, there are two main repos for the aging integrations. One is integration score that are mainly maintained by Datadog, but they are also open source and people contribute with PRs, with issues, uh, comments, etc. And we have also integration extras where integrations are managed uh, or maintained by, by people outside Datadog, or in my case, people outside the aging integrations team. And um, I, I want to, to ask Julia what, what are uh, her views on, on how that communication with community is, is being built at, at Datadog? Well, mainly through <laughs> GitHub, I'd say. Um, people can come to us with PRs directly or opening issues. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes they come through support, but they end up opening a PR themselves, so there are all sorts of, of flows there. Uh, but uh, the GitHub PRs is the most is the most common way we we engage with the community. There are office hours as well in a public Slack, and um, where uh, you can talk with community members. But usually, we we try to be pretty responsive with GitHub. Good. Um, so yeah, just, just to follow up on that, yes, we do have a public Slack uh, server, so please join if you haven't. And there is, uh, inside that Slack uh, server, there is a channel called uh, hashtag integrations that you can either use to ask questions about any of the integrations that you're, you may be using, but also about development of integrations. And we also run uh, office hours, so it's a Zoom call one, one of one week is in a um, EMEA uh, friendly time zone. Uh, one is a more North America um, time zone friendly. So join any of those uh, and you can go there and ask about your open PR or how to get started. Anything that, that um, you may, may want to ask about um, building integrations. Uh, Christine, what about you? What's, what's your experience of uh, working full time on an open source project uh, and everything that entitles of having your, your work in the public, uh, your relation with the community? Um, how does that work for you? Yeah, um, so being on an open, working on an open source project full time has definitely been a um, really interesting experience, uh, having that direct communication with our users, our customers, as well as other contributors has definitely been a really great development experience, I would say. Um, it brings um, it brings a, attention to you know, certain use cases that we may not have um, encountered or certain, in, certain features that we may not reflect in our environments. Um, having that sort of community allows us to build better products and also to keep the user's experience at the forefront of our design and development process. Very good. Um, okay, so uh, this is all we had prepared, but as we said, one of the ideas of this series is to be as interactive as possible. So we are going to spend uh, as much time as needed for questions. 
some things if you think that building integrations or working on the agent full time is a career choice for you that you may may want to um, pursue, uh, you can go to our careers uh, page. Uh, you can see all the openings. Um, some of them are remote as well. And uh, also, if you want to start building integrations, you can either go to our documentation or also you can go to our training site, so that is learn.data.hq.com, where there is a, a, basically a training that you can go in your own pace, uh, fully interactive, so you will be actually building an integration that can help you uh, get started. We got the first question. Thanks, Lucas. Um, their question was, do any of the extras integrations turn into a core integration at some point? And I guess, if so, how? I can take that one. Uh, it has happened once only. Um, the reason why, would, why we would adopt an integration into core is... Um, if the maintainer is no longer maintaining it and we have uh, a clear need, like there's a new version of the product and the integration doesn't really work anymore and there, our customers are asking for it or something like that. Um, but unless unless there is a good reason why would we would do that, we leave them in extras. And I guess that doesn't uh, leaving them in extras doesn't mean that they uh, they it just means that there is someone else maintaining them. But I guess if you yes. if Datadog finds issues or want to uh, send PRs, they would do as any other any other. Yes, in fact, we we do sometimes when when we add new tooling or new requirements in the validation, we update extras PRs to. Uh, so they so they are adapted to the latest requirements. Okay. Uh, while we wait for more questions from the audience, I'm going to ask a question uh, myself. So I, you were saying that uh, the integrations are tested both uh, Python two and Python three. Um, are there any plans to drop Python two at some point? How that deprecation? That is, is, is going to work, or is it going to stay for, for a while? Hey, that's a hairy one. Uh, <laughs> we don't have very concrete plans. However, we do advise not to use uh, Python 2. This means uh, Agent 7 uses Python 3, Agent 6 you can choose, so you can even change it. Uh, the reason why it is no long, not recommended to use Python 2 is because Python itself has dropped support for, um, for Python 2, uh, that means that a lot of libraries won't update anymore. So um, you, you're going to be missing some new features. There are features that are only coming in Python 3 already. Um, we may encounter that in the future, maybe some specific integrations are only going to be built for Python 3. So while we don't have a concrete timeline around dropping support for Python 2, uh, it's recommended that you try and make the switch as soon as possible. The only issue you could have to make the switch is if you have custom checks that are using Python 2 and you're having trouble migrating them to Python 3. If that's the case, um, you, you can contact support and we can help you if needed. Okay, so if I if I would start today building from a scratch an integration, the recommendation would be to just go directly to Python three and even and and in terms of testing, should I be worry about writing end to end testing for Python two or that's for, for integrations extras, for example, is not something that is required? Oh, uh, I mean, for integration extras, it's not a strong requirement that you you have compatibility for both. Uh, you, you could put it on the readme, say this integration is only going to work for agent seven or higher. Um, and then if you're gonna if you're gonna share something with the community, we're not gonna <laughs> we're gonna not gonna ask you to do extra work if it, if it's not what you need. 
Okay, uh, and you mentioned, and now that you mentioned, I think this is this is important to to explain. You said if it's Python three only, you say uh, agent seven uh, onwards. Uh, can you explain a little bit that difference? Be because I think sometimes it's a little bit confusing the difference mm -hmm. between agent seven Oops. and agent okay. six. So agent six and agent seven have the same functionality. Uh, the major difference is that uh, agent seven comes only with Python 3 embed, while Agent 6 has both versions and there is a configuration flag that lets you choose which one to use. The reason we did this is because custom checks, again, you want to be able to switch to Python 3, make sure that the, your custom checks are still working, and if they're not, you can switch back, just changing a configuration option without having to reinstall the whole thing. Mm. That also means Agent 6, the package size is bigger, but other than that, functionality-wise, they are the same. Okay, good. Um, so we don't have any more questions. I'm going to wait a minute just in case someone comes. Um, there is one question that just arrived. Um, it basically, uh, I need to... So basically, they're asking, they're, they're just saying that it's great that uh, the session was led by, led by three women, and uh, she's going to process what she, she heard today. Just thank you very much, Alessandra, for, for coming and, and your feedback. Um, and I guess is asking, um, and maybe I ask Christine first, and then, and then Julia. Christine, what is your favorite integration, and, and why? Mm, I think maybe it might be a bias because I've uh, worked on it as my first few like independent integrations, but I enjoyed working on um, Cilium and Istio. These were, I think, the first couple of integrations that um, I de developed independently, and it gives me it gave me the opportunity to work more closely with Kubernetes environments, and um, and that definitely was a plus point because part of the learning and onboarding process. Good. And Julia, do you have any favorite child? Hello. I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's a hard question. There are nearly 200 to choose from. Um, but at least the first you remember when, when, you're, when you started your, your job. The first I remember. The first I remember, uh, I guess, uh, the Postgres one, because it's huge. And most integrations are super straightforward. Like they hit an endpoint, gather the response, done. Postgres runs lots of queries depending on which Postgres version you're running. And it's the same for MySQL. They're both immense. Um, so yeah, they're a bit special in that sense. And we've done a lot of iterations over them to get them to to tame them um but i don't know if that's a good reason to remember <laughs> a bit of code good um next question from dragon uh, is it possible to integrate with the main platform not the agent so that the data doc pulls information through the api without aging integration yes and no um data that cannot pull information through the APA. However, you can push information to Datadog through the Datadog's API. You can also integrate using the uh, libraries that we have for different uh, programming languages. But again, this is a, a push a push method. So you can have whichever system you want for collecting metrics, or you want you you can emit metrics directly from your code uh, into Datadog by using the REST API. Yes, have a look to our to our REST API documentation, which is a, has been a great work by the documentation team. So definitely check it out. Um, and Dragon is a follow, doing a follow-up question. Is that how integrations like Azure or Cloudflare uh, are done? And I think that's, uh, uh, you can talk about the crawler ones that you, you explained. Uh, at the beginning, Christine. Yeah, I believe that is um, how the. Um, I think speaking from like AWS, I know that they 
uh, the crawlers are hitting like CloudWatch endpoints and stuff like that. And that is how um, the integrations enabled within the Datadog uh, web app is, that is how they're being done. Yes, basically one of the things that, uh, just to, to follow up on that question, is one of the things that um, those are not running in the agent, uh, they're running on Datadog code. So when you, you have your Datadog org and credentials, you basically add your cloud credentials and it's the code on the Datadog platform itself is going to use those credentials to get um, data from, for example, cloud providers. That was the last question that we had. Um, in case, let's wait a minute. Every time that we wait a minute, there is a new question appearing. So let's, uh, let's give that a chance as well. But if not, uh, thank you very much for attending. I think this was, uh, this was uh, a lot of uh, knowledge to process, as Alexander said. Uh, so please uh, reach out through the Slack channel, uh, through office hours, uh, through GitHub, uh, if you have any questions. Um, and I really, as a, as a contributor myself, I really encourage you to, to give it a try. It's lots of fun. You get to learn not only how the agent uh, of Datadog is built, but also you learn a lot about the project that you want to integrate with. So it's a, it's a win-win. Um, uh, and the last question that was about the recording of this session, there will be a recording. So as soon as we uh, finish the session today, we will process this recording and it's going to be available in two places, either our datadoc on .datadoc.hq.com website and also on the Datadoc's official YouTube channel. So uh, probably will take a couple of days, three days. And if you sign up for this one, uh, you will also get an email when the recording is available. So thanks again. Uh, thanks, Julian, and Christine for uh, showing us uh, how aging integrations are built. And see you in the next one. Bye. Okay, bye. Thank you, bye.